Hi guys! So, welcome to the part 2 of the Trematode screencast and to start our lecture for today, uh, we have Fasciola Hepatica and other sheep or also known as the sheep liver flu. Okay, so... Um, sheep liver fluke or giant liver fluke. So this is the, these are the common names of fasciola hepatica. And the mode of transmission of fasciola hepatica is when you ingest metacercaria insufficiently cooked vegetation. So for example, in kangkong. So these are the possible sites where metacercaria could insist. So the diagnosis of fasciola hepatica, of course, uh, would be involving microscopic identification of ova in fecal sedimentation. So, the treatment for fasciola hepatica would include bitayanol and praziquantel. And clinical signs, since fasciola hepatica is an example of sheep liver flu, so clinical signs would include um, jaundice and liver enlargement. Um, Fasciolysis is the disease caused by this particular parasite and it is otherwise known as the liver rot. So parang nabubulok yung liver. Now, if in case that um, because of the preponderance of the tape of, of the, the worm, not tape worm, sorry, preponderance of the worm, um, there's a possibility that the pharynx of the infected patient uh, may be congested with the parasite so this may result to the so-called halzoon so the clinical condition of pharyngeal fasciolysis is also known as halzoon so symptoms include severe headache fever chills urticaria um, back pain eosinophilia severe anemia because um, these particular fluke worms are also capable of sucking blood of about 2 ml per day can you just imagine the enormous amount that you are losing because of this par of because of this parasite. So let's talk about the morphology. So the adult is considered as a large worm, um, covering about 30 millimeter in length, and it appears as if it has shoulders, and the shoulders, the shoulder uh, may be attributed to the presence of the so-called cephalic cone. So in this particular parasite, you would notice that. The oral and ventral suckers are of equal size and upon examination of the intestine, you'd also notice that the intestine is highly branched. Now, if you will be looking at the ova of the parasite, uh, it is considered as one of the biggest helminth eggs and it has a well-rounded posterior end. So that is the reason why um, morphologically, the egg may be described as the hen's egg-shaped ovum. Okay, so if you will be looking at the uh, at the illustration, so these are examples of the first intermediate host of the parasite. This is an example of aquatic vegetation where Fasciola hepatica metacercaria may insist. Okay, so again, uh, if you notice, um, this particular parasite has a shoulder-like appearance. Um, this shoulder-like appearance is actually due to the presence of the cephalic cone. Okay, so the cephalic cone. Okay, so another example of the parasite. So it has a, it, it, it is as if that you are able to see shoulders. So here, you'll be able to see parasites at uh, the ova of the fasciola hepatica. So you'd notice that there is an operculum here well-rounded posterior hence the nickname hence egg-shaped parasite so let's talk about the life cycle of course the definitive hosts are humans but if you will be looking at the other reservoir this could be animals that are fond of eating aquatic vegetations which may include um, cattle or sheep so the first intermediate hosts are snails, such as the Linnea philippinensis or the Truncatula species. So what happens here is when humans defecate in the river, so he will be passing out, uh, if he is infected, he will be passing out an embryonated egg. Okay? And once the embry embryonated egg 
comes into contact with water, so it unembryonated becomes embryonated, and the residuum will hatch out from that particular ovule, and eventually it, it will swim until it reaches the snail. Now, inside the snail, you have the so-called intramolluscan stages. So it's, again, first intermediate host would include um, Linnea philippinensis or Tuncatula species. So it becomes porosis, redia, and cercaria. Cercaria will eventually um, swim until it is able to insist on any water plants or the so-called aquatic vegetations. So metacercaria on water plants may be ingested by humans which are considered as the definitive host and other reservoir which includes sheep or cattle. Okay, so inside the human, um, it will exist in the duodenum. So it will grow in our small intestine. Okay, so there you have it. Until, until it becomes adult, so after it has existed in the duodenum, because because that's the metacercaria, okay? So remember, encystment happens in aquatic vegetation. X, X, cystment happens in the duodenum. And then once it has existed in the duodenum, it will now grow as adults in hepatic biliary ducts. Okay, so again, what are the water vegetation so this include of course the most common here in the philippines are kangkong so if you're a fan of eating kangkong kangkong is such a delicious nutritious food masarap kasamang sa sinigang but then again be sure that we thoroughly cook it kasi you know kasi um diba ang tendency natin whenever we we cook sinigang um we do not want we do not want um we do not want um sinigang to be uh, ano yung overcook kasi it becomes soggy, hindi na siya masyado masarap. But then again, be sure that you'll be washing it thoroughly and at least maka mapainitan man lang natin siya together with the sinigang para ano, mamatay yung metasurgaria. Okay? So, that's the life cycle of Pasciola hepatica. Okay. So, moving on, you also have other um, liver fluke. Uh, this time we have the so-called dicrocilium dendriticum. Okay, it is an example of terrestrial liver fluke. Okay, so the transmission of this particular parasite is through ingestion of metacercaria. Okay, and okay, so the metacercaria is found in secondary intermediate hosts, and then terrestrial snail or slugs are considered as the primary intermediate host. So, this agent is mentioned only to provide an example of adaptability. So, the worm is highly adaptable. So, it is also confined to warm, moist areas of the world where gastropod secondary intermediate host mingles with scavenging, arthropod ingesting definitive host, and most of the internal factors described for other liver, liver flukes are applicable as well as well to um, the dendriticum. So, so which means that um, the dendriticum, Pasciola hepatica, um, they actually share uh, almost the same life cycle. Uh, they in fact only differ on the species involved in the secondary intermediate host and the primary intermediate. Okay, now let's talk about echinostoma species. So, the spiny mouthed flukes. So, this is our nickname for the different species of echinostoma. So, echinost echinostoma elucanum perhaps is one of the most popular species under the echinostoma. So, otherwise known as the garrison fluke. Okay, so the transmission is through ingestion of metacercaria and the metacercaria incidentally is also found in snail as the secondary intermediate host which means that the common reservoir of these particular parasites are many snail eating mammals definitive host and that also includes as humans okay so the prevalence would include oriental asian tropical and subtropical countries so 
The diagnosis of this Garrison fluke is through, dia- through microscopic identification of ova in fecal sedimentation sub stool sample, and the treatments would include praziquantel and niclosamide. So, as what I've told you, Echinostoma elocanum is one of the most popular species. So, the common name is Garrison fluke, and there are two diagnostic features of the adults. Number one is the presence of circumoral disc, and this is quite unique because the Echinostomus illocanum circumoral disc is provided with spine. And then another thing is that the presence of the lobe and tandem testes. Since it is lobe and tandem, it is commonly described as the dumbbell-shaped testes. Now, the eggs of Echinostoma illocanum is considered is considered as the second biggest fasciolopsis, okay, and fasciola. And they are almost similar, okay? So, the first intermediate host includes snails, and the species are Gyrolus convexusculus and Hippiotis umbilicalis. So, these are snails. However, the second intermediate host are, are Pila luzonica. So, in Philippines, it is otherwise known as Puhol. So, kinakain natin ng Puhol bilang mga Pilipino. Um, and it's one of the most popular um, dishes, especially in the provinces. And vivipara angularis. Ito naman, um, in the provinces, we call them the susong pangpang. Kasi usually sa mga ilog siya nakikita. Okay, so these are, um, these are the parts of Echinostoma lucanum. So you'd see here, you have the oral sucker, the ventral sucker, the uterus, and the lobe testes. So, again, diagnostic features would include the, the um, dumbbell-shaped testes or the lobe testes, okay? So, this, this would be the ova. So, you'd notice that there is also an operculum, one of the second largest ova, okay, after fasciola and fasciolopsis. Okay, now let's go to heterophyte species and metagonimal species. Heterophyes, heterophyes are considered as the smallest but the deadliest trematodes. Okay, so heterophyes, heterophyes are also known as the von Siebold fluke. Okay, it is the smallest intest- intestinal fluke, but this is the deadliest. Um, perhaps the reason why it is considered as the deadliest is because of its size. Uh, it is the most pathogenic and because of its size, it's so small that it can even reach the heart causing the person to have the so-called cardiac heterophidiasis and it is fatal. Uh, some people would die as if he's dying from heart attack. Okay, so the adult is piriform in shape and it is provided with large central third sucker. Um, it may not sound good but it's called genital sucker. Okay, so so some some trematodes are are just provided with the oral and ventral sucker, but this time heterophyes heterophyes are provided with the third sucker called the genital sucker. Okay, hmm. and heterophyte flukes. Okay, the ova are actually small. So this particular ova here measures only between twenty to thirty microns. Um, it is light brown, ovoid in shape, and contains symmetrical miracidium. Um, I think in this particular slide, you'd be able to see the, the miracidium here. Okay. So, it doesn't have any abopercular protuberance. So, you'd not be able to see any opor- operculum at all, unlike other, unlike other um, fluke worms. And the eggs are small and operculated with broader end than conorchis. But uh, I, I told you that there's no oper, uh, operculated opening, unlike other lukeworms, okay? But we, we can identify this as operculated, um, uh, operculated the anterior part because you'd notice that it is it has a broader end okay and similar with clonarchis it has a knob here is the knob 
at the posterior end. Okay? So, the heterified flukes are elongated, oval, or piriform in shape. Piriform like a pear shape. And it has a fine scale-like spine tegumentus. So, you notice here. And it has a gonopil. Okay? The testes in tandem at the posterior end of the body. So, these are the testes in tandem. Okay? And the ovary is globular or slightly lobed. It is located in the submedian pre or post testicular area. Okay, so it could either be in pre, so it should be in pre before the testicular area, or post after the testicular area. By the way, gonotil is the genital sucker. So here's an example. So <laughs> the genital sucker. Uh, forgive me if I'm laughing. Huh? Genital sucker is armed with spines. Okay? So, so there you have it. The morphology of the heterophytes, heterophytes. No wonder this is considered as the smallest but the deadliest parasites. Imagine a genital sucker with a spine. <laughs> Who could top that? Anyway, um, let's move on. Okay, so here's another example of heterophyse, heterophyse. So again, we have the oral sucker, we have the petrol sucker, the petrol sucker, and the low testes, and then the actual morphology of the parasite when stained. Okay, let's talk about the life cycles. The life cycle. So in the life cycle of heterophyse, heterophyse, Humans, dogs, cats, and birds are considered to be as the definitivists. So, what happens is when adult again embry uh, defecates in the water. So, when adults, I'm sorry, but when when adult defecates, it when you definitive host defecates in in water. So, embryonated egg with fully developed residuum are passed in the feces. So, what happens is um, the mirosidium will, uh, the snail host, sorry, will ingest the egg. So, it is not the mirosidium that will go to the snails, but the snail host will ingest the egg and then the mirosidia will emerge from the egg. So, hatching of the mirosidium happens inside the snails and they will be able to penetrate the snail's intestine and their there, inside the intestine, you have the intramolluscan stages, which includes sporosis, radia, and cercaria. Eventually, um, cercaria shall be released from the snail. So, cercaria will penetrate the skin of fresh or brackish water fish. So, when you say brackish water, it's a mixture of it's a mixture of sea and sea and fresh water. So, siguro yung boundary ng ilog tsaka ng dagat. Okay? And it will insist as metacercaria in the tissue of the fish. So the host becomes infected by ingesting undercooked fish containing the metacercaria. So again, metacercaria will exist in the small intestine and it will grow as adult in small intestine. Okay, so no one, uh, have you ever wondered why you have also an other animals? So these are the reservoir because dogs, cats, and even and even birds, migratory birds, for example, may even um, eat this particular secondary intermediate host insufficiently cooked. So again, the snails are such as the freshwater, brackish water, saltwater snails such as Melania juncia, or formerly known as Hyplorchis taichui and Tiara riqueti, or formerly known as Picalderoni, um, serve as the first intermediate host and secondary intermediate host would include freshwater or brackish water fish. So as you can see here, these are the different species of Philippine fishes found harboring metasarcara of heterophyte species. So there are many species of fishes in our country. So biyang sapa. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar. Dalag! I'm sure you're familiar with dalag, bangus, hito, lapu-lapu, biya. 
and then tilapia. So, yan. So, these are the different species of Philippine fishes that might probably harbor heterophyte species. So, guys, better cook these fishes thoroughly. Okay? So, I think we have already discussed the life cycle. So, pathology. Pathology would include inflammation, peptic ulcer disease, or acid peptic disease, heart failure because of the very small size of the worm. It has the capability of borrowing in the heart, into the heart wall. In some cases, even it might even cause intracerebral hemorrhage. If the infection is light, um, it is said to be asymptomatic. However, in heavy infection, you might probably feel intestinal irritation, diarrhea with abdominal pain. Um, eosinophilia or increase in eosinophils may be observed but no anemia. Okay, so eosinophil increases but there's no anemia, unlike other tapeworms. Uh, sorry, fluke worms. Okay, lab diagnosis would include um, cat, the modified cattle cats. Um, be careful observations of the egg anova. They are too small, so probably you might miss it. And PCR is a sensitive diagnostic tool. Okay, epidemiology. So it is reported in Egypt, Greece, Israel, Western India, Central and South China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines. Japan, expectedly, because of the fond of eating sashimi and other uh, insufficiently cooked dishes. In the Philippines, um, it is quite common because our fond of eating, we are fond of eating kilawen. Okay? So, worldwide distribution, uh, it is adapted to snails belonging to various family, but not very specific with respect to their secondary intermediate host, which means that if the secondary intermediate host is not found in that particular country, so there's a very minimal chance of us finding heterophyte in that particular location. Okay? Epidemiology, we have data way back as early as 1980s, says that less than 1% of, of 300,000 collected stools uh, said to be positive with heterophyte. However, in year 2000, the research team of Dr. Belisario found out that in Compostela Valley, that's uh, it's one of the poorest um, places in Mindanao or in the Philippines in general, Siguro, the prevalence is about 16.7%. And it even increases up to 36% in 2004. In Davao, which is the same region as Mindanao, the same island of Mindanao, the, the prevalence rate is about 0.8%. So it is quite common in that particular place or in that particular localities of our country. Treatment, uh, prosequantel is given in three doses. So the ideal dosage is 25 milligram for every kilogram body weight, okay, over one day. So we can easily prevent it for as long as we'll be avoiding the ingestion of raw or improperly cooked fish. So capacity building of lab staff is important because um, it's the ova are too small that it is easily easily missed, particularly if the if the ova are not stained. Okay, surveillance in other region where kinilaw is being eaten. Kinilaw, if you're not familiar with kinilaw, um, uh, fishes are just uh, we're just adding vinegar, onion, garlic, chili in the fish, and we're not actually cooking the fish, so it will not kill the parasite. Okay. Oh, there you have it. That ends our trematose discussion. I hope you guys are doing good. Keep safe, everyone. Please do not go out without any necessary um, necessary things to do. Okay, so be sure that uh, you will comment down below um, if you have time for able to watch this in Edmodo or in other platform. Please comment down below. Uh, to give us your insights, particularly what can you say about heterophytes and terrifies? Um, smallest but the deadliest virus. Okay, so God bless everyone.